Today we'll be going over the concept of evil in Middle Earth. So if you're new here, welcome to Arpa Halfling, where we talk about Lord of the Rings and a little bit about D&D. So let's get to it. Okay, so if you were with me last week when I was doing the Tom Bombadil video, at the end of that video, I had mentioned that I kind of believed that part of the reason why Bombadil wasn't affected by the ring was because there was nothing the ring could offer him. He was content in his life. And that kind of got me thinking about how, like, is that the case with other people with the ring? And so I just kind of wanted to explore this a little bit. And I wanted to shoot all the way back to Melkor and you know, before the creation of Arda. And we're told that, you know, Melkor and all the other Ainurs, I come, you know, they come from the thoughts of Eru of the Luvatar. And at one point, Melkor goes off and finds the fire that uh, Eru contained and was giving to everyone. He went off to go find it on his own in the void because he felt like he could do better with it. Like he thought Eru wasn't doing enough with this fire. And so that kind of starts this idea, at least to me, that you already see this prideful nature in Melkor and this discontent that like what he has isn't enough. Like the fire that Iluvatar has given him isn't enough. He wants more, you know, this greed. And if we kind of jump forward a little bit, this thought is kind of repeated a little bit when we look at the Vanyar. So the Vanyar at this point are living uh sort of with the Valar, they're living in, it's described as in the fullness of the trees, you know, the full light of the trees. And Melkor, therefore, doesn't have a whole lot of, a, like, can't really do anything with them. It says that they see his uh, deceit. And I, even when I first read that, I kind of took that as like, well, you know, this could be taken as two ways. One is that they're literally in the light of the trees and therefore can see, like, darkness they can see the shadows in like a very literal sense but i also felt like it meant that the vanyar were very content with where they were they it says that they're content in the light of the trees they're in the fullness of the trees and so there's nothing that melkor can offer them to manipulate them there there's nothing for him to corrupt in that situation and even with the tellery like yeah the tellery are kind of sort of separate and so he's like well there's nothing I can do with them but also if you look at the Tellery they're also very content with the, where they are and in both cases with the Vanyar and the Tellery both of them have a close relationship with the Valar um with the Vanyar literally living with the Val with the Valar and then with the Tellery having this close connection with Omo Ose and Unanen and so Melkor works on the Noldor who are people who like who are greedy in a good way at times, but greedy for knowledge to explore more. They, they, they don't want to just stay in one spot. They want to go and, and see what they can find and explore. And I think in this is really where Melkor is able to manipulate and take advantage because of their discontent. So with all that in mind, it got me thinking of, you know, Bombadil, but also got me thinking of the hobbits and how, they all reacted with the ring. Um, and when I say all, I mean Bilbo, Frodo, and Sam, because Sam was a ring bear bearer for a short period of time, and Gollum. While he's not technically a, a hobbit in the same way as uh, Bilbo, Frodo, and Sam are, he's a hobbit adjacent, if you'll have it. So uh, I wanted to look at all of that and how the ring corrupted them and the amount of time it took to corrupt them so like with Gollum he is described as already being kind of a bad seed right like he's already sort of thieving around his village like his grandmother <laughs> doesn't like him at all and the way he obtains the ring is through murder and through theft and so there's already something here that the ring can corrupt like it's it it was very easy to corrupt this. And when Bilbo has, or when Gollum has the ring, uh, it's even described like the whole reason why he, he runs off to the mountains is because 
he was kicked out of his village. His grandmother kicked him out of the house because he was such a bad person. He was stealing. He was just becoming more and more vile. And so, again, you see this image of Gollum being greedy, being prideful, wanting more, not being happy with what he has. And the ring is just corrupting this, just taking hold of it. And you see that. like, And all this isn't like you know, mind-blowing information. This is all pretty basic in the book. And so if we look at Bilbo, so it does seem like Bilbo, it doesn't get corrupted with the ring as much. And I've even heard like opinions of like, well, why didn't, you know, like why is Bilbo seem to be a little bit different from Gollum and Frodo when it comes to the ring? As far as like, you know, why weren't there any Nazgul's coming after him? Why aren't there, you know, why isn't Sauron coming after him? And I think part of that is because like Sauron didn't have the strength and the, like he wasn't at a point to even do anything about Bilbo. Um, but the ring is already like working to get out of the mountains and to get away and to make its way towards Mordor. And with Bilbo, while he may not have realized it when he first grabbed the ring, Bilbo did steal the ring. So there's already this like sliver of corruption right at the beginning on how he retrieved the ring. And again, like I don't think Bilbo obviously realized this at first because it's just some shiny thing on the ground and so he picks it up. But he does realize later when Gollum's crying out for the ring, he does realize he's taking it from Gollum. So this is theft. Like, he doesn't return it. <laughs> he holds on to it. So, like, you already see that. And how he's retrieved the ring is already sinful. And immediately Bilbo lies to the dwarves on how he got the ring. Um, and so, and even more so with Bilbo... He lived in the Shire, right? This is a, a land of people who are content with where they are. They don't want to be a part of, you know, the big people's problems. They just want to live their life and drink and have food and be merry and that's it. But Bilbo says, you know, he has that little Turkish part in him that wants adventure, that wants to go off and do other things. And so again, there's this image of discontent. He's not happy with where he is. And... While I don't think it's, like, to any, like, greatness as, you know, the greed of, of Gollum, uh, there is still something there that the ring can offer him, right? So he's not content with where he's at, so the ring can offer him something. And granted, we really only see Bilbo use it as, like, trickery. <laughs> um, but he does wear the ring for an extended amount of time. And the ring doesn't, like, it doesn't really seem like it takes too drastic of a change on him. And uh, another thing to point out is that Bilbo, as far as my understanding, Bilbo is one of two people who willingly gave up the ring. While it was difficult for Bilbo, especially since he had it for so long, he was able to give it up and give it to Frodo. And so you see this this point of, of uh, this innocence in the hobbits and this content and humility and who they are. And I think that's important into what the ring can corrupt. So if we look at Frodo, Frodo did not want the ring, right? He, he, it wasn't something that he took. It wasn't something that he, you know, found or stole or whatever. No, this was something that was given to him. It was an inherited item. So immediately the way Frodo has retrieved the ring is completely different from everybody else. Right? So even if we go further to Isildur, it's taken. <laughs> right? So like Frodo is the only one where it is freely given to him. And I think that is very, very important as to why Frodo lasted as long as he did with the ring and using it as few times. Of course, he's given more information than Bilbo was about the nature of the ring. But like, he literally has, like, the ring has to wear him down just by weight, by temptation, by being in the enemy's land for it to finally take hold of him. And that's not a small thing. I think the fact that Frodo was given the ring freely 
entirely changes how the ring can manipulate him. And Frodo, we see this idea that Frodo does want to go with Bilbo. He does want to see the elves and, you know, he he wants to go on these ventures. But it's still said that, like, mm, but Bil uh, Frodo's heart's really in the Shire. Like, yeah, he wants to see these things, but not really. So again, there's this sort of, he's more content with where he is. And even when he's he's given the ring, you know, Gandalf tells him, like, the whole, like, keep it secret, keep it safe. And uh, he, it's kept away. Like, Frodo, it doesn't seem like Frodo uses it at all, you know, maybe a little bit. But from my understanding, he doesn't use it really at all during that time. And... I think, again, that's it, it's important. <laughs> Frodo's content with where he's at, and there's nothing that the ring can corrupt. Like, it's technically still in his possession. It's been given to him. And so, yeah, there's this temptation for Frodo, but he's able to fight it off because he's happy where, with where he's at. He's, he's good. And the only reason why he leaves uh, the Shire is because Gandalf finally tells him, like, you've got to get out of here. Like, people are coming. you got to leave. And so when Frodo does begin to leave, he tries to hide, you know, the the reasoning for leaving. And so I guess you can say he, he lies about where he's going and what he's about to do. But even in that, when it comes to the ring, is done out of protection of others. Whereas Bilbo lied about the ring to protect himself and what he wanted. But Frodo's lying here to protect others. And I think that's a big difference. And, you know, even still, he doesn't lie very well because Merry and Pippin, you know, figure it out. And Sam, you know, eavesdrops. And um, and so they go on their their journey and everything. And it takes the entire journey for the ring to wear Frodo down. And Frodo tries to give this ring up, like, I'm, I'm going to say three times. Because he tries to give it up to Gandalf. And Gandalf's like, no, 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 don't offer it to me. He tries to give it up at the Council of Elrond, right? Like, that was the whole point. He takes it to uh, the Council, and he's supposed to be done with it. That was his That was his part of the job. He's done it. We're good. And even then, like, yeah, I believe the ring is still tempting him to hold on to it. And I think that's, you know, maybe a big part of the reason why he stood up and said, no, I'll take the ring. But I think also, like, with Frodo's innocence and how he's already been shown to care for the people around him seeing how important it is to destroy this ring, I'm not sure Frodo really had, I, I don't think Frodo felt like he had really an option at this moment to give the ring up. And so I think for him, it was natural for him to go and go ahead and take it because we see what three times on this journey that he tries to leave off on his own. Like he doesn't want to involve other people because he recognizes the danger of the ring and the importance in destroying it and saving the world. And so I don't know how much of a choice he actually had in this. Also, I think fate had a huge role in this, and I don't think fate was going to allow it to leave his hands. Um, and so, so yes, I think that's also very different, you know, between Frodo carrying the ring and other people is that he's trying to get rid of it. He doesn't want to hold on to it. Whereas everybody else that we know of that's had the ring wants to keep it for themselves at, at, up to this point. They want to keep it to themselves, and they want don't want to you know share the ring. But Frodo's trying to get rid of it. So again, there's less I feel like for the ring to corrupt. And so when we move on, we get to where Sam now gets a hold of the ring, right? So he believes that Frodo has died from uh, Shelob, and so he takes the ring, recognizing that like, hey, I, this still. We still need to complete this mission. We still need to destroy the ring. And so he takes the ring and we get this glimpse of like of Sam even trying to be manipulated into, you know, what he could do with the ring, right? But here we are, we also see the humility and the content in Hobbits and that Sam's like, no, <laughs> I'm not going to fall to this manipulation. Um, that's not the point. That's not what needs to happen. And Sam is the only other person besides Bilbo that I'm aware of that gives up the ring. And granted, he doesn't have the ring for very long, and so that might play a part in it. But it could also be canceled out because they're they're here. They are 
you know, closer than this ring has been in a long time to Mordor. And so I think that kind of plays, I, I don't think him giving up the ring should just be, well, he didn't have it for very long. Like, nah, yes, but he's also in the enemy's home field. So let's not take that for granted. And so Sam being able to give up the ring, I think is, is huge. And that he was able to resist the temptation of the ring, uh, I think also shows his content and humility in life. And so when we do finally get to the destruction of the ring, uh, you know, Frodo doesn't do that <laughs> willingly. You know, Gollum has to attack him, bite the finger off, and then falls over, um, destroying the ring. And But the fact that it took this whole journey and getting to the point of destruction for the ring to finally take hold of Frodo, I, I think is paramount. And to the character of Frodo and his humility and, you know, recognizing, and it took him a while, but recognizing that, like, this was a job he had to do. Like, this is where fate has brought him and this is what has to happen. It sucks, but he knows what needs to be done. And I, the fact that it takes so long for the ring to corrupt that concept, to corrupt Frodo and saying, like, no, keep it for yourself, I think is massive. I, I don't think that should be, you know, taken for granted or, or, you know, discredited or anything. And so in looking at all of these characters and how they've had the ring and their responses to the ring, it makes me wonder is Tolkien trying to get at something here, right? <laughs> like, is is Tolkien's perspective of evil, of corruption by evil, I guess, is it based on how content a person is and how humble a person is? Like, if you are, if you are happy with where you're at, if you recognize, like, these are the cards that have been dealt, this is the bread on my table, that's it, like, and I'm going to be happy with that, like, if there's, if, Tolkien's trying to say, like, there's less for evil to corrupt then, right? So you're you're not prideful anymore. You're not greedy for anything. You recognize, you know, your blessings, I guess, that this is where you're at and this is how it's going to be. And that doesn't mean that, like, a person still won't, en won't encounter or deal with trials or tribulations. Frodo's a perfect example of that. Frodo was content with where he was and yet still had to deal with this massive responsibility. And so it's not that evil won't come your way, but that it won't corrupt you, right? And it still did damage to Frodo. Frodo didn't leave Mordor totally unscathed, you know, physically, of course, but also mentally. Frodo never, Frodo died a little bit there. And, you know, it's a huge reason, probably the whole reason why he ends up going to the Undying Land is because Frodo never really came back from Mordor. So it's not like if you're content and humble and, you know, just a happy-go-lucky person that evil's never going to come your way and that, you know, you'll come out totally free and happy and butterflies and rainbows. That's not the case. You're still going to endure hard times, but you'll come out of it still. Like, they, you can still come out and and be okay. I don't know. It got me, I don't know. This whole, I'm probably just rambling at this point, but it just got me thinking. And even like if we look at Tolkien's um, religious views on it, like in Christianity, you know, the first sin is pride, right? So man was greedy for more knowledge, greedy for to be like God, which, you know, obviously we see that with Melkor. And you know, throughout scripture, there's this idea, like, as Christians, we are told you will go through hard times. You are not guaranteed this, like, prosperity gospel picture. Like, you're not guaranteed, like, Lamborghinis or anything if you have enough faith. That's not the case. You're guaranteed to go through hard times because this is a, you know, a sinful world. And, but if you, you know, if you are humble and if you trust God, then, you know, he'll guide you through it sort of thing. And I'm just wondering if, like, that's kind of what Tolkien is getting at. Like, if whether it's on purpose or just a product of his own belief, like, you see that here where, 
yeah, if, if especially with Frodo, like, Frodo's told, like, fate has brought him here, right? Like, Edu's name isn't exactly mentioned, you know, spelled out for us. But, you know, Edu is God, and he, you know, is the creator of fate in this situation. And so, like, Frodo is told to kind of just, like, dude, just trust the process. This is where life's brought you. It sucks, but you just gotta, you know, you gotta persevere through it. You gotta just stick to it. And, and so definitely there, I think Tolkien's religious beliefs are seeping through in that moment of you have hard times, but you just have to keep the faith, I guess. And yeah, so I just thought this was interesting. I will most likely come back to this topic at another time. Um, the further we get through the Silmarillion and through through other tales. Um, but yeah, I just really wanted to talk about the concept of evil in Middle Earth and if Tolkien's trying to get at, like, just be content and humble with where you're at and uh, don't let evil deceive you and make you believe that there's something better out there um, and, like, what you have isn't good enough. I don't know. I hope you guys enjoyed this. This was kind of a, a little bit of a weird one, I guess. Uh, just me rambling, but it is a let's talk about, and that's where I just ramble. So I hope you guys enjoyed it. I hope you guys have a wonderful, blessed week, and may your homes be filled with food and cheer. Bye.